Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I'm Kim Scott, co-founder of Radical Candor and author of Radical Candor and Just Work. I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor Podcast. Showing compassion is real work. And like all real work, it's rewarding. And it's also taxing. In general, we tend to undervalue the emotional labor of being the boss. But Kim, as you've often said, this emotional labor is not just part of the job. It's actually the key to being a good boss. So today we're going to discuss emotional labor through the lens of a scenario. It was sent in to us by one of our listeners looking for guidance. And this person writes in, they say, first, I appreciate all the concepts around radical candor, try hard to use them with my team. And this person's a proponent for others to pick up the skills. So they were thanking us. So thank you. And now for some advice, I am VP of new product development with a team of 450. Quote, I'm working on succession planning with two individuals, both of whom are senior directors on my staff. I'm able to practice radical candor with one of them. This person is really willing to listen and course correct and wants me to be even harder on them in order to try to improve. They continue writing, I try to practice the same principles with the other person. In two instances, when I've challenged directly with lots of caring personally, this person has broken down and cried. This disarms me and I back off and now really dread going back at it again. It is exhausting. I owe it to them to give them the feedback. I truly want them to improve and be in a position to move into my role, but they're taking steps backwards in their behavior. So how do I navigate this? Thanks again for all the great work your team does for many. All right. So here's, I'm going to jump in and say what I think, unless Jason or Jump away. Okay. I'm jumping right in. So I would say the problem here is not that the person receiving the radical candor cried, but that the person seeking advice had a hard time dealing with tears. And I don't mean to sound like I'm lacking in compassion. It is exhausting when the other person cries. It is really hard when the other person cries. But as we've said before, when the other person, when you're giving feedback and the other person seems sad or mad after you've given your feedback, that's your cue to move up on the care personally dimension. But of course, it's tempting to just back off and say nothing or to have an emotional response of your own. I think part of the problem here is that often I give someone some feedback, they have an emotional response, and now I'm having an emotional response to their emotional response, and we're losing the thread of the feedback. And that's Mm -hmm. very, that's very, very human. So I don't want to say, oh, the problem is, you know, (laughs) the problem is not them, it's you to this, to this person who writes in. This is a very common problem. It doesn't mean you're a horrible person. If the uh, if, if you're having the if you're having difficulty dealing with someone else's tears, but it is part of the job. It is part of the job, and and this is this is a question that I get all the time in my coaching practice. Uh, I'll be practicing a conversation with someone that they're sort of dreading having, and then they'll call me up afterwards and they'll say, "Oh, I I totally screwed it up because that other person started to cry. And it doesn't mean you screwed it up that they started to cry, but it does mean it was hard for them to hear. So I don't know. What do you all think? Yeah, I I just want to amplify that final point, which is that there's nothing wrong with the person crying. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. In fact, how you respond to the tears could actually draw you even closer to that person. So I think that's a that's a really important point. The other thing, Kim... You know, sometimes we hear a lot, a a flavor of what you're talking about, which is people will say, oh, this person is just so sensitive. You know, what do you do? We will often get questions in keynotes, especially in workshops, like, oh, you know, how do I deal with people who are so sensitive? And I I have to laugh because as a self-identified so sensitive person, (laughs) uh, I... Um, you know, I get a special kick out of it. I know Jason, you and I have talked about that. How do I deal with the so sensitive person? Can you share when you've gotten that question, especially like in a keynote where you don't have all the context, how you tend to answer that? I, I think my answer is often a flavor 
uh, of Kim's answer to the to the initial question, which is sensitivity itself is not a problem. In fact, sensitivity may make someone more attuned to things that are going wrong or things that are going right. Like sensitivity can be a strength. I think often when people ask this question, they're asking a version of the same thing, which is it's hard for me to deal with people who are more sensitive than I am. Usually that's the frame of reference is like, I would not react in that way. So can I just tell them to stop being sensitive? Wouldn't that be fine? Um, So I I think the... (laughs) And the answer is no, you cannot. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, And and what I often encourage people to to do is to try to separate two things in these moments. One of the is to separate the sort of emotion with the actual action or reaction that the person has to the feedback. Because you might have, there might be emotion in the moment followed by introspection, self-reflection, the person comes up with an action plan and they're all, they're off to the races, like applying the feedback. That's a different situation than a person who becomes so overwhelmed with emotion that they are completely unable to hear. Like it requires two different responses depending on whether or not the person's actually hearing and processing the feedback and also expressing emotion, which I always see as a sign of trust right? Like someone willing to express emotion in front of me, that means they, they trust me with that emotion. Um, versus the emotion is actually making it impossible for the other person to hear the feedback. And then I think it requires a, a different answer. What was that uh, animated Inside Out? <laughs> Remember? Mm-hmm. In the, so it. in that film, there's a scene where the little girl starts to cry in front of her parents. And I think the lesson is like part of the purpose of the tears is that it gave her parents an opportunity to show they cared. Yep. And I think that's, I, I, that's a good way to think about someone else's tears is what they're doing is they're offering you an opportunity, a very clear signal that it's time to move up on the care personally dimension. Uh, and, uh, you know, and as someone who sometimes is a little bit obtuse about getting feedback, I, uh, it's not that I get over emotional sometimes. My mother said she gave me some feedback once or my swimming teacher had given me feedback. She said, Kim, you swim like a stone. And I was very proud of myself. I'm like, mom, she said I could swim like a stone. So, so you may, if, if you're giving me feedback, you know, you may have to move out a little further on the challenge directly dimension. Or you may need to just be more specific and use context, observation, result, next steps as a result yeah, of swimming but when like you a sink stone. to the bottom of the swimming pool, you scare the shit out of me. Yeah. I love that story. You know, I'm, I think, I can't recall if I've shared this on the podcast, my feedback from first grade, which is that. And I may quote, Amy is very sensitive to criticism and, you know, cries when she hasn't done something perfectly, something along those lines. And I I think that's why I ended up here. But I was really struck (laughs) by what Jason said and, and by what, Kim, you were just sharing around this idea that it's really a chance to show how much you care. And I know in those moments when I've had some emotion with Jason, you know, in our in our one on ones and having that presence and that ability to really not absorb the emotion, but to be with the emotion, to have the space for the emotion, to not feel like we have to rush away, that there's a spaciousness and a presence. It does really build trust. And then I can get to the sort of, okay, now what? And so I think just first of all, so, you know, Jason, that idea of separating out the there's the emotional response in the moment, and then there's sort of the capacity to take the next step. And I think your ability to hold that moment, create some more space, enables me to more quickly process the emotion and get to that sort of problem-solving next steps. And I think even more important, like you said, building the trust that I'm not going to feel like, oh my gosh, I've blown it because I got upset about something. And Kim, I think you really teed us up with that. Jason, is there anything as I'm saying that that like is coming up on your side of those conversations? I was thinking of false dichotomies. Um, one of the reasons why Kim wrote the book was because she was tired of the false dichotomy that you either could be effective or you could be a jerk. I think there's another false dichotomy when it comes to emotion that the two choices are run away or absorb it like a sham wow. 
<laughs> What's um, a sham like a what? Wild, what? A what? <laughs> for, for our listeners who might be under uh, 35 years old, uh, there, this was like one of those late night TV things. Um, and it's a super absorbent, theoretically super absorbent cloth. So it could, like, it. It could, oh. it could soak up any liquid, regardless of the volume, this like tiny little. Is it like a yeah. I'm thinking yeah. of Bounty, the quicker picker upper. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 that, that's, a, that's another version. Again, for our fans under the age of, of 35, they probably didn't hear that commercial either. But in any case, this idea of like that the only options I have are to to sort of take the emotion on board to like make it my own and to process it myself versus run away from it. What you described, Amy, is something in the middle, which is like the emotion Mm -hmm. sits between, right? It's a thing that you're experiencing. It's in the conversation, but you don't have to take it on. And I think the reason I have gotten better at that other than therapy (laughs) um, (laughs) is because I have had enough experiences where I could not map my behavior to the emotion of the other person. Meaning like I would be super direct, same person. I'd be super direct and the person takes the feedback great. I'm super direct the next time they take it terribly. I'm really indirect and they take it terribly. (laughs) Like there there was enough times where I started to realize like, well, this isn't me. I'm not in control of this. And my behavior, of Mm -hmm. course, it's an input, but it's not the ultimate thing. And that helped me release the sort of guilt and blame that I put on myself and made it easier for me to exist in in the presence of an emotion without making it mine and therefore adding even more emotion to to the conversation, thus making it less likely that we would really reach escape velocity from the emotion um, and toward some kind of resolution. Yeah, I think that what what you're describing, Jason, is so important. I think, what's that bridge that where the where the wind resonated with the and the bridge started wobbling. What's it's the something I uh, bridged too I've far. I've seen the YouTube of it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I feel like emotions are like that sometimes between two people. Like I say something, the other person gets upset, and then I feel guilty because they're upset. And now either I back off and zoom over to ruinous empathy, or sometimes as a defense mechanism, I will, instead of feeling guilty, I'll say, oh, you're just too oversensitive, or you can't Mm -hmm. take the (laughs) the, Mm -hmm. the feedback. And I think this happens, uh, I mean, all of us do this all the time. And I think just remembering that when we communicate, we communicate on an emotional plane and a rational plane at the same time. And if you ignore all the emotional signals that the other person is sending to you as somehow not reasonable or not right to have these signals at work, then you're just not going to communicate very well at work or anywhere else. So, so we need to be able to understand the emotional signals without necessarily amplifying them or mm-hmm. absorbing them too much. Yeah, Kim, as you were talking, there's this real need we often talk about of having to be agile, both with our own emotions and the emotions of the other person, and this idea that we're operating both on the emotional and the rational plane simultaneously. Jason, uh, when you were talking about you know, this idea of you would say almost the same thing or have the same behavior to the same person and it could land very differently... I think is such an important point. We are going to show up differently to these conversations. That other person is going to show up differently to these conversations. And if we go back to the original letter, one of the things that had leapt out at me is that, you know, this person is really bought into radical candor. They want others to pick it up. They're practicing and they say, you know, I'm able to practice radical candor with one of them. This person's really willing to listen, wants me to be even harder. I try to practice the same principles with the other person. In two instances, when I've challenged directly with lots of caring personally, this person has broken down and cried. And so I think it's really interesting to think about the principles are the same, but we very intentionally do not get too didactic about how we're executing them, or excuse me, correcting, implementing them, since we were uh, (laughs) trying to not have aggressive language. Uh, And so I think what's really interesting here is without having the specifics in front of us, is this person actually trying to implement with one person the exact same way they're trying to do it with the other person. And we would say, well, in fact, you're going to need to do it differently for 
two different people. And by the way, you might even need to do it differently for the same person. Uh, yeah, on, depending on, on whether they've had lunch or days. not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What do you all think of that? 100%. Yeah, I, I couldn't couldn't agree more. This thing that I, I think a lot of people do, which is I, I'm going to try to develop a pattern, and that pattern is going to be really use, useful to me with uh, how I do my work. And then you make the transition from some sort of technical or otherwise direct labor type of work to management. And you're like, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to develop a pattern. That pattern's going to work really well for me. And all of a sudden it's like, well, it doesn't work well. And it creates an emergency because it also comes with tears or anger or frustration. It comes with these other things that you have to deal with. This conversation to me suggests another thing, which is the pattern that you want to develop is one of flexibility and resilience. The pattern is a meta pattern. It is not, it <laughs> yeah. is not the same behavior in every situation. <laughs> it is the, the, I develop a pattern. I develop a relationship with these sort of interactions that I have with my team members in which I am looking to try to demonstrate resilience and flexibility. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And I want to go back to like, not only what it feels like to be the boss and have somebody cry, but what it feels like to be that employee. And yeah. that was what that was where my mind went as soon as you read this this note because I once had a boss who told me point blank he said you cannot cry in front of me I cannot handle tears and this was a useless thing to say I mean it was in fact counterproductive because I did not want to cry in front of him any more than he wanted me to cry in front of him but as soon as he said that it was like Tolstoy has this anecdote about how his brother told him he had to stand in the corner of a room and he couldn't leave until he quit thinking about a white bear. And then all he could think about was the white bear. Uh, And so with this boss, as soon as he said, you cannot cry, like he would just walk down the the hallway and I'd I'd feel like tearing up. You know, uh, it is you can't tell someone. I mean, you can. Uh, but when you tell someone how not to feel, it makes it more likely that they're going to feel that way. It's like mm. that meatloaf song, Don't Be Sad. Every time I hear that song, I get a little weepy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll... Back to some... our listeners who may not be familiar with yeah. that song. I recommend it to you. We'll put it in we the show might have to. Yeah, I, we have a lot of now some great title options here between meatloaf, don't be sad, and, you know white bears and tears. Uh, But I think, you know, Kim, you're reminding me of one of the things that we'll often say, which is this idea, if we had, you know, emotional Novocaine or some sort of painkiller, you know, we would, but these are conversations. and, And one of the things that I've loved most about working at Radical Candor is that I have proven for myself that by actually having these difficult conversations, by actually feeling some emotions, naming the emotions, we get even closer. I mean, just recently we were talking about the podcast and and how we want to keep improving. And, you know, we were kind of naming like, oh, I'm feeling kind of frustrated on this or, you know, and Kim was feeling frustrated and I was feeling frustrated. And I think there's something about, first of all, naming it for yourself is very helpful. And by the way, naming actually helps sort of calm down the emotional reaction that you're having in the moment. There's a lot of great research. Um, Dan Siegel talks a lot about sort of name it to tame it. So naming it can be helpful for you. It also can be a way to sort of signal to your folks that you're talking with of what's happening in the moment. So I feel like what a gift that we can both name those emotions, have the conversations and get to an even better place. Yes, I think uh, I love that about our dynamic. I also would say it's important to name your own emotions. It can be a little risky to name someone else's emotions. Absolutely. Because yeah. some sometimes if I start to cry, it is not a sign that I feel sad. It's a sign that I am furious. And oh, that absolutely. is sometimes confusing for people. One thing we haven't talked about, so either we could talk about it now or we can come back to it, but is the so far, we've been talking about the presence of emotion, and I think that that tears are definitely a sign of the presence of emotion. But I think the one thing we haven't touched on yet is what do the tears mean? Yes, this is a good time to talk about that. And also, by the way, if I'm upset, about, if I am sad or mad, and you show me that you care personally, I'm far more likely to tear up than if yeah. you, mm-hmm. uh, you know... Uh, totally. 
and, and so showing me that you care is not going to insulate you from my yeah. <laughs> from my tears, unfortunately. Actually, so Kim, yeah. can I pause on that? Because I feel like that's such an important point. I want to know what would be an example of someone showing you care personally that would warrant get, get you even a few more tears? Do you have a specific example? Yeah, I mean, I one time had a boss who he just had this, very, he was very um, compassionate. And when he would, he could tell when I was upset and he would get this sort of, I mean, he just gave me a particular look, like, I'm really sorry. And I, and it would like that his expression always would, <laughs> would make me weepy. And I, he couldn't help his expression and I couldn't help my weepiness. We just had to get through it, you know? There was another time when I, I remember somebody like put their arms out to give me a hug and that like turned the waterworks on. So like if you want to turn my waterworks off or you want to help me <laughs> turn my waterworks off, which I, I really, I hate crying in front of other people. So usually I'd prefer not to hand me a bottle of water and that'll give me a chance to unscrew the cap take a sip of water and put it back down. And that will often help me regain composure. In fact, somebody explained this to me when I had an employee who would burst into tears, every, like routinely for a, for a couple of months. Every Friday, this employee would come into my office, sit down and burst into tears. It was like not the way I wanted to end the week. And it, it started to kind of like weigh on. I felt like this, this person who wrote in, I was like, oh, and somebody said, take the Kleenex out of your office and put bottles of water in your office. Because sometimes just handing this person the box of Kleenex turned the waterworks on, whereas handing them a, a bottle of water helped them regain composure. So that's like a very small tactical thing to, to help people who don't want to be crying in front of you sort of regain help if, if that's what they want. But if they want to cry in front of you, like, try to let them. Yeah, I, I think that's what I meant by what do the tears mean. It is easy to imagine that the tears are mean rejection of your whatever you, criticism you have shared. That yeah. the, the tears are like, I can't handle this. I can't take this on board. But that may not be what they mean. And there's information that we don't have from the original write-in. So we don't know how long or how closely the person who teared up a couple of times has worked with this other person, especially if it seems like a relatively new thing or, or maybe like, is it out of character? Is it in character? Is this like a, a, a normal occurrence or is this something different? Because when I think about this, like even the, the most quote unquote sensitive people that I've worked with, you know, I, I would say it's, it was pretty rare for them to, be so upset that they, anytime I gave them feedback, they would burst into tears. Like that, that's, that would, I, I would rare. not say that of any se sensitive person that I've, that I've worked with, very, very rare. And so usually there was useful data underneath the tears, right? There's something that was going on and maybe it was about the feedback or maybe it was that they were having a really rough day, or maybe it was that a, a combination <laughs> of those two things. Um, or maybe it was that there was some other frustration that was going on. And this moment sort of gave them, because they felt comfortable enough with me, this moment gave them a, an opportunity to sort of let out some of that emotion that they were dealing mm -hmm. with. And it was completely unrelated to either the feedback or the sort of how their day was going, but some, some other general issue that they were dealing with. And so I think if we're not curious about what the tears mean or what the emotion means, I think we're going to lose out on pretty useful data that might help us figure mm -hmm. out a, a way out. And so when we sort of run away from the tears, when we don't offer a chance to sort of regain composure, I think we lose out on some pretty useful information that will probably both help bring you closer and make it more likely that you can resolve, get to some kind of resolution with the feedback that you're trying to give. What's coming up for me, Jason, when you're telling that is an anecdote. I was, when I was working at Google, there was uh, an, a policy issue that, that kept, I was in an argument, a long time argument with this other executive and my boss one time sat me down and said, ah, oh, you know, this executive has decided to, it was like not an emotional issue, has decided to change the revenue share. And I 
I just burst into tears. <laughs> I could tell my boss, was, it wasn't exactly feedback, it was just information. I could tell he was really shocked. Uh, and and I, I realized I was doing IVF at the time and I was pumping myself full of hormones. And like, the, but he said, what, why is this so upset? He didn't say, don't cry or you shouldn't cry or why in the world are you crying about the revenue share? <laughs> Which, which was a, would have been a legitimate question, uh, but he just like, what's wrong, you know? And and I was able to tell him it wasn't the revenue share; it was the <laughs> the IVF hormones <laughs> crying there, uh, and and it was good to be able to just have that conversation. I love. I really appreciate that story, Kim, because I wanted to get a sense from Jason of what you found works well for the the questions. Obviously, we know what we don't want to say, which is, you look so sad, you know, like naming. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm filled. I was sad, but now I'm just pissed. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, just that question for Kim sounds like it landed really well. What's wrong? Even just the feeling of support behind it. But Jason, did you have, as you were sharing around how you might get underneath the data that's being expressed through the emotional processing. Are there certain questions you found land well? Obviously, different people, different things will will land differently. But what's been your mode to approach those follow up questions? I hate to to say it depends, but it really it really does depend. If we go back to the original <laughs> inquiry, if this is a new set of interactions or a new set of behaviors, I. I might take a step back and like talk about the meta for a second and say like, Hey, we've had a couple of conversations like this. Both times you've gotten really upset. Like I want to understand that so that I can do this better. So that these conversations could go better in the future. Help me understand what's going on. And if this was completely out of character, meaning like this has never happened before. We've had tons of conversations that all of a sudden the person bursts into tears. I I think I would then be able to say something like that. Hey, like this hasn't happened before in our conversations. Like, it seems like this is especially hard for you. Help me under, understand what's going on. Something along those lines is probably the way that I would approach it. But ultimately, I think my immediate instinct is uh, once I've offered the person a bottle of water or something like that to help them regain their composure, my immediate instinct is to get curious, to bring the emotion into the conversation as opposed to treat it like it didn't happen. Because I think there's also a temptation, like as soon as the tears dry up to be like, well, that was really awkward. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> to the next thing. The, the, white, um, the white bear has left the building. Let's pretend it was never yeah. here. <laughs> and, I, and I think the only thing I would add on top of that is that if the other person says, like, I, I don't, I'd rather not talk about that, I want to focus on the conversation, that's fine too. But I think you don't know what would be helpful to them without at least asking. Mm-hmm. When I became a manager for the first time, there, there was part of me that felt like in these kinds of conversations, part of my job was to manage the other person's emotion. And that is a giant mm-hmm. overstep. That is not your job as a manager. Mm-hmm. We all are responsible for managing our own emotions and for acknowledging the impact that what we have said or done has had on another person's emotion. So it's not like mm-hmm. your emotions have nothing to do with me. Your emotions are your problem. Uh, but, but rather to, to sort of understand that there's no perfect words that I can choose that will control right. another person's emotions. There are things I can do or say that might elicit emotions in another person. But they're responsible for their emotions fundamentally. At best, I can manage my own emotions and stay present for the emotions the other person has. Let's let's shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about tears, sadness. Let's start to move into some of the other emotions that were in that Inside Out film, Kim, that you referenced, which is you know things like anger, frustrations manifesting perhaps through yelling, but sometimes another person's emotions can even cross the line to being bullying or even abusive. Not easy to see where that line is. From your perspective, Jason, where do you think that line is from emotional response and behavior into more of a bullying or abusive behavior? Well, I think it's pretty important to separate emotion from behavior. Yeah. A response coming from an emotion. Correct. You can feel an emotion without behaving in a way that is harmful to somebody else. Um, I, I think the the place where we, I often try to offer people 
some compassion or grace is to say, hey, we're not always immediately in control of our behavior when we are experiencing a very strong emotion. But I do think it's okay to expect other people to be able to control their behavior, especially if that behavior becomes harmful to others. It's, in my mind, it's less about the, the line between, well, the first consideration is not less about, the first consideration is not the line between yelling and bullying, but between feeling an emotion and acting in a way that is harmful. Yeah, I think I think you're right, Jason. I mean, what's coming up for me is that obviously it's okay to feel any emotion that you feel, like you you're going to feel your emotions. And the question is, I think it's also important to if if someone is angry about something, it's important for them to be able to communicate that to you in in some way, shape, or form. Because if if they have to repress the anger, then it's gonna it's gonna build up and blow up. It, it, in the same way that if someone is sad, it's important for them to be able to show you that in some way. So, but so what what's coming up for me is like, like it's pretty easy for me not to yell because I've been taught since I was a child no yelling. <laughs> There's no yelling, you know. So, so, in fact, it's hard for me to express anger when I feel it. So it's easy for me, and I'm just I'm wondering if this is biased. It's easy for me to say yelling is not okay, but crying is okay. But maybe that's not quite fair. I don't know. What, what do you all think about that? Obviously, it's okay to express in some way, shape, or form either anger or sorrow when you feel it. But I, if you were to tell me you cannot cry, I don't know that I, I well, I'm, I'm wondering, do you, do you have a... a, a a sense, Kim, that crying is like a physiological response in which there's no sort of space, but you know, they talk a lot about the space between stimulus and response. So crying is something that you feel like you actually don't have any ability to control, whereas you feel like people could control yelling. No, I don't. I I think, I mean, it is, for example, I was in a parent teacher conference with, (laughs) with my daughter and I was very proud of her. And I said, and I said, I'm so happy that you're so happy. And I almost started to cry. And I knew that she would be humiliated. And like, I did manage to prevent myself from crying, <laughs> even though I felt it coming on. I was like, it's like I used up a year's worth of self-control, but I did not cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think what you're saying is really important. I, Jason, I feel like we may have talked about this once. Um, what's coming up is in a workshop I did where there was a culture where showing emotion was important, especially for leaders and especially some form of yelling, which showed that it was really this was really important because I'm yelling and I'm showing a lot of passion. And so in fact, a a, a colleague in that group said, I am not a yeller. And so I have to say sometimes to my colleagues, imagine that I'm yelling because it was like they were trying to (laughs) present that the really strong emotion was there. So I think there's something that you're really tapping into. And I'm Jason, I'm curious between the output of the emotion, tears, yelling, the behaviors, um, do we distinguish between them and how much do we actually, are we saying to Kim, like, well, sometimes we really need to control all of it. Sometimes it's okay not to control it. Yeah. I, I guess like in my mind, it can't be never cry and never yell or always cry and always yell. Like, there, there's <laughs> gotta be something in between, <laughs> in, in between those, those places, because that doesn't, neither of those things has the possibility of being inclusive because they're not going to work for, for everybody. Um, so there needs to be some, somewhere on the, on the, on a, on a gradient, somewhere between those places. And I think for me, the question is, what does the yelling mean? Again, is the yelling, the goal of the yelling to intimidate me and to stop being the conversation is the goal of the yelling. Like I've been in a conversation where voices are raised and it's really easy for sort of everybody's blood pressure to go up. But if you, have just a tiny bit of separation, you realize the person's not yelling at me. They're basically yelling into the void. There's there, you know what I'm saying? Like they're yelling, but it's not directed at, at me or at somebody else. They're frustrated and they're expressing that frustration. Um, and that, that Kim, I think is what you're trying to say is like, I, I think it's important for us to have room for those other expressions of emotion I mean, in a very sort of liberal society sense, it's like your rights 
you know, your right to swing your arm stops at yeah. my face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My uh, nose. <laughs> yeah. I think like if, if, if I could go back and advise my boss who told me I can't, you know, you can't cry in front of me. I think the problem with that, uh, was that he implied that the problem was me getting upset rather than that right. he wasn't owning his emotional response to my emotional response. Yeah. And right. if what he had said instead, if he had said, I, I am really, I can't handle tears. It's okay that you're crying, but I need to end this meeting because, because of my emotions. The problem is my mm -hmm. emotions, not your emotions. That would have been okay. Like to me, I, I have a hard, somebody yells at me. I have a really hard time with it. Yeah. And, and so I think what I would say is, look, I have a hard time with yelling. Can we continue this conversation in 10 minutes? Like, let's both mm -hmm. go get a cup of coffee and come back. I, um, I, I love that, Kim. And actually what, what's also coming up for me between sort of yelling and tears is also layering in power. Yes. Uh, and so I think it's very interesting if you are yelling at your boss, um, how that would have gone versus tears. If it's your boss yelling at you, yes. how that goes. For me, if my boss is yelling at me, is going to land very differently than if my boss is crying with me. Yes. Um, and I will feel much more empathy towards probably the crying boss versus the yelling at me boss where I will feel belittled, et cetera. So just let's layer in. I'm curious, power into those two emotions and behaviors. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think if you're the boss, it's really important to remember that you yelling has a much, it has a huge, a huge impact. Whereas when you were not the boss, your yelling didn't have quite as big an impact. So it's more important if you're, if you're in a position of authority to try to, to manage your instinct to yell. But I think it's also important if you're the employee and if your boss is yelling at you to, if you possibly can, to try to have some compassion, like to try to get curious, not furious, so that you don't give up too much of your own autonomy in that, in that conversation. Before we move on, Jason, any thoughts on layering in power to the different emotional responses? There's so much coming, coming up for me because in some ways we're talking about like deep psychological roots for our reactions to these behaviors that go back to like family of origin. And it doesn't like, I have a different kind of reaction to yelling than I do to crying. So I recognize that like, I, I, I share Kim to some extent, I share your bias to, for preferring crying to yelling. <laughs> um, I internalize things differently because of the power differences, right? Like the, I, I might see my boss yelling at me as being very aggressive or very belittling but I have a very, I have an equally sort of negative reaction, but it just maybe not as in, as inward uh, mm -hmm. when somebody else yells, which is like, this is unfair and unjust. And why do other people have to listen to this person yell? And who are, you know, who do they think they are to express themselves like this? So like, I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm recognizing that there are, there are layers to, to, to this. And in some ways, the best thing that we can do is offer each other some grace when we do yes. have these emotional responses because you don't know what's going on for that other person, right? You don't know what is like the root of that emotion. You don't know why they chose yelling instead of crying. You don't know any of those things. And so if we can give ourselves a little bit of space to like explore that as opposed to judge that, yeah, you, you probably make it a much nicer place to work, but also I would say like the planet becomes a nicer place to live. Like we offer yeah. each other that grace. There, there's, there's real power in that. Yeah. And the, and the grace needs to extend to the other person, but also to yourself. Like it's yeah, okay absolutely. that you're having an emotional reaction to their, exactly. their reaction. But like the more you can just sort of take a deep breath and, uh, and, and not make a bunch of assumptions. I think there's also, there's kind of something that is underlying everything we've been talking about, but hasn't been made explicit, which is gender. Uh, and, and so I just want to lay that on the table because I, it, it is, it happens pretty often that men will tell me that they're reluctant to give women feedback because they're afraid the woman will cry. And these are not sort of misogynist men hell-bent on ruining the careers of the women around them. I think it's a genuine and, and legitimate question. And I have two bits of advice for them. The first is that you're not water-soluble. Like, it's okay. It's okay if they cry. And the second bit of advice is, and maybe this says more about 
me than the men who've worked for me, but men cry too. In fact, men cry, the men who've worked for me have cried just as often as the women. So I'm not even sure that it is accurate to say it's more likely that uh, an employee who's a woman is likely to cry. In fact, I was talking to this investment banker and he said, you know, it's always like the thick necked, tough looking guy who winds up busting into tears, not the, not the woman who worked for him. I mean, this is a a human, we all have emotions and I just appreciate Kim, you bringing that perspective in because I think sometimes it might not be heard as much. And I think we want to give space for everyone to have emotions for us to manage our own emotions, finally knowing we can't control someone else's emotions. And I, I really appreciate the conversation around tears and yelling and Jason bringing in the sort of family of origin stuff. So I think there's some more to unpack perhaps on that topic. But for now, shall we move on to our tips? Let's do it. it. All right. So now it's time for our radical candor checklist. Tips you can use to start putting radical candor into practice. Meet emotion with compassion. Uh, If somebody gets upset, angry, or defensive, it doesn't mean that you failed, nor does it mean that they have failed. It probably means that they care about their work, and that's a good thing. Your job is to react with compassion, not to tell them don't take it personally. If someone does become emotional, take a moment to acknowledge that emotion. You can always ask them simple questions to help them move out of that, whatever the sort of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response they might be having and into a place where they can re-engage the rational part of their brain. When you ask questions like, tell me how you're feeling right now, or how would you like to proceed, or how can I be more helpful, These have the effect of helping someone move out of threat response and into problem-solving mode. Tip number two, acknowledging emotions is a great way to build relationships and communicate better with your team. The quality of these relationships play a vital role in your success or failure as a leader. Remember, the worst thing you can do is ignore emotional reactions or dismiss them as, as not reasonable. Emotions like anger, sorrow or fear are part of being a real human being. And we can't care personally unless we're allowing ourselves to be real humans. People shouldn't have to leave their humanity at home when they come to work. Tip number three, get curious about why someone is crying. Those tears, that emotion can be a shortcut to the heart of the matter. There's some real data that is being shared with you. Because often when somebody is frustrated or angry or upset enough about a situation, whether it's at work, like Kim's revenue stream, or whether it's something that's happening outside of work, this is your cue to keep asking questions until you understand what the real issue is. Now, if somebody doesn't want to go that far, at least showing that curiosity and compassion helps build a relationship. By reacting to the emotion with kindness, by not avoiding it, it can help you better understand what's really going on and get more connected to the folks you're working with. And finally... There's a lot of evidence that non-white and or non-male folks tend to be penalized more heavily for showing emotion. So be extra careful to check your reaction for bias in those cases. We owe it to everyone to meet emotion with compassion. I have a question. Kim, tell me about the difference between sorrow and sadness. You tend to replace sadness with sorrow. And as someone who loves words, I'm curious what the difference is for you. I have no idea why I did that. <laughs> I, I don't know. It just sounded better in the moment. I don't have a, I don't, there's nothing profound in my word choice in this case. Okay. I will work through my sorrow at not knowing the answer. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, for more tips, you can go to radicalcandor.com slash resources to download our learning guides for practicing radical candor. Show notes, go on over to radicalcandor.com slash podcast. If you like what you hear, please do rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. If you've got a career topic you want to discuss or an advice question like this, email us podcast at radicalcandor.com. And of course, Radical Candor swag. Click the shop link on radicalcandor.com for your mugs and magnets and notepads. Sorry, we don't yet have the emotional Novocaine. We're not sure we'll get there, but we've got lots of other fun things for you there. Bye for now. Take care, everyone.
Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com. 